Well, welcome. This, although I thought it would be simple, is more complex than being the prophetic voice and that God has given me strong words to follow my last strong message, but this is going to be easy going in one sense. I'm going to talk about introducing the Bible, an introduction to the Bible, uh, that you might value it, that you might hunger and thirst for it. But first, I must say, I didn't read the Bible and find God. You can do that, but I met the author of the Bible. I met the risen Jesus Christ. And then I found a Bible, happened to be in the house I was living in. It wasn't mine, it must have been someone else's who lived in that house. But I had a dreadfully powerful, wonderful meeting with God, meeting with Jesus. And then I turned to the Bible. So I would say the Bible must introduce you to the person of God. That is the point. And if you hold that before you, I think it will be more valuable to you and you will not get sidetracked or bogged down as so many trying to make the law of God, and we'll talk about that, the law of God a bit, <clears throat> trying to make that something it isn't and we'll look at that. So it is about you having a personal encounter with the living God. And, and that encounter will uh, turn you around and then you will read his word. I will say that the Bible is learning God's language rather than an academia. I, could t I was thinking it would be good, maybe, to have a survey of the Bible. But in the Bible, you learn God's language. You learn many things that are foreign to our modern concepts of life in general. And it is also a reflection, as in a mirror, of the person of God. So it's learning God's language. And it's seeing in his word a reflection of God as in a mirror. That is a New Testament theme of looking into the perfect law of liberty as in a mirror. So it, it is a, a biblical theme to be looking at the word of God as a reflection, not only of God, but it reveals what we are really. And, and we'll talk about that. The Bible begins with, in the beginning, Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created. Now, there are many arguments out there, many philosophies that will drain you and exhaust you, and they are exhausting the people who live under those philosophies. And if you know where you came from, if you know who you are, there will be a rest in your being. We'll delve into who we are by mentioning the next point. In the book of Genesis, we see man created in, in, in the image and likeness of God, uh, enjoying the presence of God. Genesis, you can, he's, he's got the, the meeting with God, which is the main point. As I said, he's got the, the presence of God is so exhilaratingly life-giving. To be in his presence changes everything, changes us. So Adam, before the fall, knew that as his daily experience, he walked with God and enjoyed company with God. But one of the biggest things, don't be distracted, don't let the world philosophy steal it. There was a colossal fall. Adam was deceived by the devil, really. He was lured away, deceived him and his wife were deceived to disobey God, simply to disobey God, become independent, that was the temptation. You will be wise. And they took 
of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, not an apple of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And they became wise, but fools. They became wise as the world around us, living in a two dimensional world, totally unaware of the glory of God that does fill the earth. But as I said in my heavy message, the blessing, the covenant, the enjoyment of the glory of God on the earth is only tasted by those who are in company with him, have a relationship with him. So there was a colossal fall and man departed from God. Now, the reason, reasoning I would want to bring to you is you, you aren't a sinner because you sin, you sin because you are a sinner. Now, again, people argue that they don't like that. They feel the world out there. How can we, you know, how can we even start if you say we're sinners before we even sin? Because that's the truth of the fall of Adam. We are in his loins. And that, again, that's biblical language. We're in the loins of Adam and we inherit the nature of sin. And therefore, we sin out of that nature. So it all comes round to when we want to be healed and be rid of some of those traits. We need to go to the root. But that's a very deep subject. And it brings in that healing that God brings to set us free from that root and nature of sin. It's progressive and God is gracious. I would use the word bloodline because we are in the bloodline of Adam. That's why we partake of his nature rather than his DNA. It's the bloodline and that again is a thoroughly biblical truth. The bloodline was beyond other explanations. It's, it's a big theme in the language of God, which we are learning. And there are various other things that stand out and slowly come to us. But we were in the bloodline of Adam and therefore the whole world is in the bloodline of Adam and is a sinner before they even sin, if you like, because they're in the bloodline. And of course, children grow up and they start tapping into that nature. And you see it in horrific, horrific ways uh, across the earth. Now, let me tell you, Cain killed Abel. Again, in the book of Genesis, Cain, the first murder, the first religious war, and I'll tell you why it was a religious war, because Abel offered to God something that was acceptable to God. It was of the fruit or the first uh, born of the flock. And Cain offered of the toil of the ground, the labor of the ground, and God did not accept Cain's offering. And, and you could say again, is that fair? Is that fair? Why on earth does that start such a war? And it did. And it's still the kind of war today. People who are not being accepted by their attempts to please God, but in Christ, we'll, we'll know about that. We talk about it. in Christ, Jesus is our righteousness, our right standing. We'll talk a bit about that. And we are accepted by the blood of Jesus now, breaking this nature of sin. We're accepted by the blood of Jesus. But Cain killed Abel, the first murder, and it was a religious war because of offerings. Very deep. I won't go much more into that. Again, learning the language of God. The word covenant is used 293 times in the Bible the word covenant. And again, that will progressively dawn on us that it is very big in God's uh, language, the word covenant. Basically, it, a bank note has, I promise to pay the bearer such and such a sum on the basis of this note, a promise that is fulfilled at the presentation of that bank note. 
God has made a covenant, a new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And we'll talk, maybe we'll have to talk about the law of Moses. We have the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. And that's very difficult for us to appreciate that why did God give the law through Moses? The first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses and they're called the books of the law. And in them, at one point, in all the other things that uh, are covered, uh, Moses is given the law of God and he sets it before the people as a covenant. If you keep this covenant, then you will be accepted by God. But it was a, um, a failing covenant and there are strong reasons for that. All the sacrifices, all the attempts at obedience were fully met in Jesus. And this is why Jesus came and brought in a new covenant. And that's very deep how that um, all that was done in the Old Testament was attributed to the cross. That's too deep. That's more in the Bible survey. But I will just say that the law was given through Moses. Keep all these things, law, 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 very difficult, very difficult. They couldn't do it. it. It was even explained in the New Testament that it is impossible. We'll talk about that. The Bible says in Galatians, Galatians is a good book about the law and the liberty and freedom uh, that surpasses the law. In Galatians 3, 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the old law, some preachers are still using it without knowing it, trying to bring about obedience by slamming you with the law. And it was a tutor to bring us to Christ. Now Christ is our teacher. Christ within us is bringing the transformation. Yes, he uses the, the words of the Old Covenant and the New Testament. And he uses the Word of God because it's all a reflection of God. It's all the language of God. But Christ within us is bringing about a transformation which results in us walking in the Holy Spirit, in which case it is obedience. To walk in the Holy Spirit is to be obedient. So we can get sidetracked. I'll give you another one from Galatians, Galatians 2.16, knowing that an, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So if you are trying to win favor with God by keeping the laws of God, you will not be justified by that. We are justified by faith and a sweet communion of walking in the Spirit. I think it's, it's more exacting to walk in the Holy Spirit. And I talk about in Christ's reality. And some people think that's heavy, that's heavy. But walking in the Spirit is to walk fully in obedience. And we learn that progressively. How do we stay in sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit? We do back away. Our hearts do get tarnished. We get darkened. We sometimes get deceived. Now, the key is to become transparent and sensitive to know when you've backed away from the Holy Spirit and to, to make the effort to get back. I had to get back in the last few days. It's strange because last Friday, which is about five days ago, I had the anointing to bring this message and I thought it was so sudden. I thought, I'll back away. Just think about it, Lord. And, and not that that was the reason, uh, as though it was disobedience. I was just checking. 
but I, I strayed away from a very powerful, sweet anointing that was upon this message. I hope it's still on here a bit because I've been asking God to bring it back. <clears throat> but you see, I had to make adjustments and pursue the heart of God and not beat myself, but I just kept asking and seeking singing, coming into a place of worship, and, and sensitivity. Holy Spirit, will you come? And I've been praying that. One of the things I, I was overwhelmed by is, I said to the Lord, I'm standing on a vast ocean. I've but tasted of that vast ocean. And really, when we come to knowing God, we are on the shores of a vast, unending, massive ocean. And what he reveals to us, we drink in and we know him. But I tell you, there is a vast ocean of God's almightiness that will be unveiled throughout eternity. So it is quite daunting to come to God and bring his word in any measure. This is probably more straightforward than the strong message God has got in my heart to follow my last strong message. Romans 3, 20. Now the book of Romans is almost like a, a legal discourse in a courtroom. Very powerful and very strong, but it will take some drinking in and time to drink in the weightiness of that legal argument from the Apostle, the book of Romans. But I'm just going to jump into one verse only, again to confirm what I'm said. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So you can be blasted by some preachers with the law of God and all they're doing is bringing you a knowledge of sin. They're not telling you how to get out of it often because it is a very intimate encounter that we need to be brought into to deal with sin. So the law and preaching under the law is just brings us to a knowledge of sin. You can say, well, that's good. It's good if you know what to do about that. It's good if you have a vision of, of the glory of Jesus and his ability to transform our lives and break old um, patterns of thinking in our hearts. So if you're good at, and skilled at bringing people freedom, I suppose it will work. But better to talk and teach from the spirit of Jesus about the freedom he is, because in him, that's where we're meant to live, abiding in him and he abiding in us. In him, there is freedom, transformation, uh, knowledge and revelation of the ability to change. So the key is bring people into the presence of a relationship with Jesus. Now, John's gospel, skipping, flying away. Uh, what do I, oh yeah, in John 5, verses 38 and 39, I'm just gonna, I've made bold one statement. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So Jesus was challenging the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were experts in the law. They were of the descent of the children of Abraham. So they held dear the five books of Moses and the rest of the Old Testament. They held it dear. And Jesus said, you search them, but you've missed me because all scripture testifies of me. That's another reason why the language of God and the mirror of God is very important because it, all scripture speaks of Jesus, it reveals him if we're reading it through the eyes of the Holy Spirit 
and the, and a revelation of a relationship with Jesus. All scripture speaks of Jesus, and that can be one of the greatest adventures of your entire life as you go through this in your entire life. Daily I pick this up, sometimes more than daily, and I've got five copies downstairs of different translations. I've got this one up here, a few on the electronic machines, and I just allow that to to hit me and remind me of, of Jesus. So John's Gospel is probably one of the favorites. I would recommend you first read John's Gospel, and I'll mention a few other things. Colossians 2 verse 9, this is a quite a Bible study, Colossians 2 verse 9, you'll have to find that, and it says of Jesus, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now biblically again, the scriptures uses the phrase the Godhead, speaking of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it brings in the thought of the counsel of Almighty God around the throne of God, the Godhead. And the Bible says in Colossians 2 verse 9 that in Him, in Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him bodily. Now that is an amazing claim and truth. And, and you see, we don't get that straight away, do we? Throughout the Old Testament, I don't even know what I've written there, the Old Testament, Old Covenant, and the Law of Moses are individuals pressed into personal relationship and the knowledge of God. So it wasn't just me having a personal encounter and loads of other people and the apostles. And the Apostle Paul had an incredible encounter, much stronger than me, and was commissioned for life. I was commissioned a bit. But throughout the Old Testament, people broke into this personal relationship. Of course, you remember David, the writer of almost all the Psalms. He was a shepherd boy in love with God. But Moses, and again I'll chuck in another scripture, uh, Exodus 33, and I, I would be disciplined, I'll say Exodus 33 verse 7 to the end, which is verse 23, because I didn't want you to be distracted if you bother to read that. Exodus 33 verse 7 to the end, which is verse 23. You'll see what I mean about bursting into a personal encounter with God. It says in that passage that Moses spoke face to face with God. And, and he was encountered the glory of God. It's a lovely, humorous little thought because a young servant of Moses, Joshua, he also encountered that, and Moses went back to do his work as the leader of the people. And Joshua, it says, if you read that, Joshua remained in the tabernacle. What was he doing? Just enjoying the glory of God. Again, another person who broke into personal relationship and encountering knowing God. This is the point of the Bible, to know God personally. Joshua. And he went on, of course, that you'll learn eventually that he took over from Moses, but he stayed in the tabernacle. He was soaking in the glory, and out of that glory, God was formulating in him the next leader following on from Moses. So that's where you need to learn if you're going to be a servant of God. Learn of him in the glory. You'll see it when you read it. It's amazing. Again, we're jumping to Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Just underlines it. All scripture is God-breathed. Again, the arguments out there in the world. Can we trust it? Can we trust it? Don't even listen. If you've met Jesus, you're not listening to them because I'm saying, Jesus, I've met you. I'm reading now and I'm 
trembling because I'm slowly realizing who I've met. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this is the infallible word of God. And, and you'll learn to stand on that truth and contend for it. I've said it already. I recommend one of the first books you read is John's Gospel. And do pause a bit when you come to where Jesus is talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will lead you into all truth. Again, like pause, stop. We're not trying to learn, learn the book. We're trying to encounter the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit when he comes bringing us greater clarity. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. You'll see that in John's Gospel. The Holy Spirit comes and he will glorify me, Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and he is amazing. And he will teach you and guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. It's a relationship. We get, we're in relationship with the Holy Spirit with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, communion with the Holy Spirit. It's in the Bible. That's another verse. I didn't quote the references. You might find that one day. Because John is one of the favorite and recommended readings, it begins with a profound language. John's Gospel 1 one to five, maybe I'll read it all, maybe I won't, maybe I will. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, and I shouldn't have pointed to the Bible because he's going to talk and bring in the profound reality. In the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, John's bringing in something, the Word was God. And it's mystery under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring us to a revelation of something. He was in the beginning with, with God. He, now the word is called he, just a matter of interest. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or overcome it. That's verse 1 to 5. But then John, a few verses later in 114, says it, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word is Jesus. It, it was in verse 1. In him was life. So John is bringing in the, the revelation that Jesus is the word of God. In him was life. And I've just gone around it a bit. The word became flesh. The word in the beginning was with God. The word was God. And verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, as the word of God became flesh. I've mentioned it in some of my heavier messages, but Jesus didn't become Jesus when he was born a baby. He was with the Father in the beginning. He is the eternal Son of God. I'm not really wishing to delve into that as this is an introduction, but let it be known. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, the Word of God who was with God in the beginning, who was God in the beginning and still is God. So is the Father, so is the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, that's really it. And I'll sum it up, but I will say, as you read the New Testament after the Gospels, as well as the book of Romans, oh, I forget, forgot to mention something rather wonderful, but I'll, I will mention that. As you read beyond the Gospels and the book of Romans, which is a legal document, which is so heavy to understand, but you will see that the apostles had to contend for error 
and, and, and deception that was trying to creep in and pollute the church. And that's a difficult thing. Even the book of Galatians I referred to a lot is a contending because it was trying to creep into the church and bring them under the law. And the apostle says, no way, no way. Don't you try and bring the law un unto us. And, and it is very deep because obedience, I believe walking in the spirit is much more obedient than, than keeping laws. So it's much more a pure obedience. So, but it, it's how it works. The law doesn't work. It never worked in the Old Testament and it certainly doesn't work in the New Testament. The old law brought people under an awareness of sin, but it had no power to transform them. You'll see that written eventually. Now, I, so I've talked about this contending, so you'll understand that. I would probably like to say, if you're going to flick through the Old Testament prophets, you could be overwhelmed like, why is he always getting at people? But the big picture is that the prophets were sent to a people who were very disobedient, not just the fact that they couldn't keep the law, which is impossible anyway, but they departed and began to take on the customs and the false gods and the very corrupt, uh, idolatrous things that happened in the world around them uh, all sorts of uh, evil and, and false worship, false gods. And the prophets were coming to plead with them to get back in a relationship. But the language of the Old Testament prophets can seem overwhelming. If you do not understand why they were sent, and you can only appreciate that over time, over time, over time, when you see how pure God was, in the beginning and how his purity had become polluted, you will understand and agree with the heavy language of the prophets. Now, finally, I will also recommend to you Psalm 119, an unusual psalm, because it is broken into the 22 letters of the Jewish alphabet. Now, not wishing to get technical at all, but there are 22 sections, and as a daily reading, not every day, whatever, but you'll see a language that is very helpful because in the language of Psalm 119, there was almost a heart cry from the writer and now the reader, as you read it, oh, oh get me, Lord, bring me back call me back, keep me, Lord. And, and it's a very good, easy meditation, if you like, daily, a few minutes, because it's just a small section, 22 letters. And, and it's a very good, you know, heart purification. It just says, Lord, keep me. And, and you'll see how beautiful it is. So I'm gonna end there and say this is an introduction to the Bible, but it's, I hope, an introduction to the person of God. That is the whole point of you reading this Bible, to know God personally and more deeply, and rejoice in, when you think of this vast ocean of who God is, uh, and you, we should be hungry, but we do get, we get tarnished and we back away from God. Don't back away from God when you've been tarnished. Do what I did. Pursue God. Say, God, show me, lead me. What is it? But remember your place is in Christ, in sweet company with God. It isn't backing away because you've broken, you know, sinned against him. That is not your position, backing away. Your position is in Christ, in sweet fellowship with God. And, and, and the devil will try to keep you from that, but you're going to be focused and say, no, my position is in the arms 
of my loving Creator and in company with God. That's my position and I'm going back there as quick as it takes and I'm going to learn loads of things by pursuing God and pressing back into Him again and again and again. And He will bring that beautiful transformation in relationship. So that's my introduction to the Bible. It went on long, longer than I thought. May God bless you. May the Holy Spirit enrich you and teach you. May you recognize the authority of the name of Jesus, the most powerful name that the Father has bestowed upon the Son of God, Jesus. That at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and the under the earth. All authority is in the name of Jesus. So when we call on the name of Jesus for help, we're calling on a very vast source and ability and authority. His name, the name of Jesus Christ, has all authority to break chains. And, and may you enjoy life in Jesus. Amen.